Imagine a world without Google. No, seriously, a world without Google. A world where you couldn't do detailed reconnaissance on your blind date for tomorrow night. A world where you couldn't find out with the click of a mouse the GDP of Kazakhstan. A world where if you're not feeling well, you can't just sit down at your computer and figure out whether to just pop a couple aspirin or whether you need to call 911. It's amazing, right? Just 10 years ago, there was no Google. And five years before that, there was no way at all to search the internet. And that posed a big problem. Because really, what use was the World Wide Web if you couldn't navigate it and get where you wanted to go? The companies that took a stab at search included some of the most iconic names in the history of the net, like Yahoo and Excite. But even though the guys who started those outfits were some of the brightest young things in the annals of American business, in the end, they found themselves unable to crack the code. Then a pair of super brainy, super nerdy 20-somethings solved the search problem. I'm going to tell you how they did it and how they became multi-billionaires in the process. My name is John Heileman, and as a journalist, I've covered the search revolution from the start. The story I'm here to tell you is about the high-tech innovations that underpin that revolution, and about the enormous economic upheaval that it unleashed. It's an exciting tale full of fierce ambition and ingenuity, full of opportunities seized and opportunities missed, and secret maneuvers and meetings that have never come to light, until now, that is. On the web today, you type my name, John Heileman, into a search engine and boom, in a third of a second, you can find out instantly that I'm a magazine journalist and peruse a catalog of pretty much everything I've ever written. Given that there are over 150 million websites and billions of web pages out there, the technology that makes super accurate search possible is kind of a miracle. And it's a miracle that most of us have come to take entirely for granted. We forget that a little more than 10 years ago, this is what the web looked like page after page of plain text, long lists of underlined sentences. Finding what you were looking for on the web was damn near impossible. There was no way to search for anything. All you could do was follow links and hope that luck would land you somewhere useful. To understand how we've come so far, how the web search miracle happened, we have to go back to the time before Google, to the story of the companies like Yahoo and Excite that paved the way for its existence and became its fiercest rivals, and to a little place in California that you may have heard something about. Silicon Valley, California. This 30-mile stretch is the place to be for people with a knack for inventing the future and an appetite for getting enormously rich in the process. It's the home of legendary tech names like Apple and Intel and Oracle. But the heart of Silicon Valley, the real wellspring of the high-tech industry, the source of countless great ideas, isn't any company. It's Stanford University, and it's here at Stanford where the roots of search can be found. Now, you might think I'm going to tell you that in a lab around here somewhere, some straight-A students and their brainy professor were inventing some new mega-fast silicon chip or some massive supercomputer that was going to take the valley by storm, and there were. But we're not interested in that. We're interested in a couple of slackers named Jerry Yang and David Filo, who were left to their own devices when their professor went on a year-long sabbatical. While Jerry and David were goofing around, they hit on an idea that would become the basis for one of America's best-known businesses and turn them into billionaires. Today, their company is called Yahoo, and it's among the most traffic sites on the web. all began when Jerry and David were trying to find a sneaky way to use the internet to win a Stanford Fantasy Basketball League. The boys were electrical engineering students, and they had access to the web. They scoured it laboriously, site by site, looking for up-to-date sports information. David figured out how to go to all these different places to get all the data from the previous night's basketball games. Pulled it all in and crunch data and try to figure out what, you know, we should change players or trade players or do whatever. It's hard to imagine more trivial pursuit than fantasy basketball, but in hunting around for obscure sports data on this weird clunky network called the internet, Jerry and David were taking the first steps on the road to search. And you know, at the time we were competing with other students from other departments, we were 
you know, trying to use technology as an edge, and they were basically reading the newspaper the next day and, you know, doing stuff on the papers. And I don't think we, did we win by much? I don't think we, we did. won. <laughs> we did win, but we didn't win by much. So I'm not sure the technology helped us by all that much, but it was kind of a fun experiment. It's not surprising that the web circa 1994 didn't help Yang and Philo much. Even to understand what this thing was and what, what the internet had to offer, you needed some kind of guide, you needed some kind of directory to kind of help you kind of navigate through that. This was a simple but brilliant thought, a directory that could show virgin web users how to find cool stuff in this new electronic world. But it was nothing like search today. It was just a bunch of categories and subcategories that you could hunt and peck around in. It was incredibly crude, compiled manually by a pair of geeks who spent hours looking at as many websites as possible, then deciding how to list them. Crude or not, though, what the guys called Jerry and David's Guide to the World Wide Web was the first thing of its kind, and it proved immensely popular. Literally overnight, it was this worldwide thing. Millions of users from around the globe flocked to the site. The guys soon realized that they needed a shorter, snappier, punchier name, one that sounded kind of, you know, exciting. Yeah. Yahoo was a great idea, but a great idea isn't enough to become a great company. It requires money, and lots of it. But as everyone knows, there's no shortage of cash in Silicon Valley. Most of it emanates from these buildings along Sand Hill Road, the offices of many of the Valley's legendary venture capitalists. I don't know what I expected to see the first time I came to this place. Streets paved with gold or something. But this is what I found. A bunch of nondescript, low-slung office buildings in what looks like an alpine village. But behind those doors over there sit the venture capitalists, the guys who preside over investment funds containing billions and billions of dollars, the guys who ultimately decide which startups get a chance to live and which never see the light of day. One of the most successful VC firms is Sequoia Capital. Its most famous partner, Michael Moritz, decided to pay Yahoo's young founders a visit in their Stanford trailer. Inside of it was a scene of total confusion. This was every mother's worst nightmare. Pizza cartons all over the place, computers and electronic equipment scattered hither and yon with the curtain shades drawn, temperature of about 85 degrees. It was a sweltering cesspit. It was a mess. There were lots of reasons to be skeptical about making an investment in Yahoo. It was only two people. The uh, business model was, to be generous, hazy. What Moritz couldn't ignore was the potential of Yang and Philo's web directory. It seemed to us fairly straightforward that anybody who uh, was offering a service that acted as a guide to all this stuff that otherwise was difficult to uncover with the passage of time, offered the potential of occupying rather strategic ground. Moritz invested $2 million in Yang and Philo's website, but it was a gamble based on little more than a hunch. The large numbers of people visited the Yahoo site, it wasn't obvious where profits or even revenue would come from. We had a company, we had to figure out a way to make money somehow, and up to that point, we had no revenue at all. Actually, it was worse than that. At the time,